My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today, I wanted to talk to you about a potentially transformative treatment for POTS and maybe long COVID. Okay, let's get started. What is POTS? POTS stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. In this condition, patients complain that when they stand up for a prolonged period of time, they feel very uncomfortable with dizziness, palpitation, tremulousness, and therefore they either have to sit or lie down or they risk collapsing. When you examine them, the heart rate can be found to be excessively fast, especially when they're standing up. Now, as doctors, sometimes when we can't explain what is going on, we just take what the patient tells us, give it a fancy technical name and make it a condition. This patient says that her heart rate goes up excessively when she is in an upright posture. Let's call it postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. That's not really a diagnosis. It's just a medical jargon filled term for what the patient has just told us. It tells us nothing more than that. But this is the term that we have ended up sticking with. In fact, I think the term POTS does patients a disservice. Because of the name of the condition, many clinicians have incorrectly assumed that it is only a condition that is manifest when the patient is upright or standing up. This is incorrect. I have over a thousand patients with POTS and I've spent a lot of time listening to their stories. All of them say, I feel rubbish all the time. I just feel rubbish sure when I'm upright. So what do they mean when they say they feel rubbish all the time? Well, they're always tired, they have bad brain fog, they have issues with lack of refreshing sleep, they have horrendous gut issues, they have chest pain, breathlessness, headaches, they even have bladder symptoms. And unfortunately, the term POTS does not capture all these other symptoms. And therefore, I prefer the term dysautonomia, which means a disequilibrium between the flight and fight systems and the rest and digest systems. In essence, these patients spend a lot more time in flight and fight mode and very little time in rest and digest mode. And therefore, they're always simultaneously tired and wired. And this is a far more appropriate and accurate name for this condition. Now, how do patients develop POTS? Increasingly, we're seeing that they often inherit a genetic vulnerability, such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome joint hypermobility variant. And they have this vulnerability, they get on in their lives, and then at some point in their lives, they get hit by some kind of infection. This vulnerability is then unmasked by this infection, and the patient starts noticing these symptoms. In essence, people are born with a genie in their lamps, and then an infection comes along, and the genie is unleashed. And then, unfortunately, they struggle to get that genie back in that lamp. The most common infection that I've come across as a trigger for dysautonomias is glandular fever. However, there are other infections that can also trigger dysautonomias, including coronaviruses. And it is therefore not at all surprising that so many people have now developed this condition called long COVID, which has almost identical symptoms to a dysautonomia like POTS. And I would argue that perhaps POTS and long COVID are indeed the same condition. Why do I say this? Well, let's look at the facts. Only 10% of patients with COVID develop long COVID. Why? If it were just about the virus, then surely everyone who got COVID would be expected to get long COVID. There must be something special about that 10% which makes them more vulnerable. Two, the severity of COVID infection does not have a bearing on whether you get long COVID or not. Well, if it was just about the virus, then logic would dictate that the more severe the illness, the greater the chance of having long COVID. We do not see this. Again, it makes you think that the virus simply flicks the switch in those people who possess that switch. Three, when you talk to many long COVID sufferers, they will admit to having some dysautonomic symptoms, albeit even mild ones, even before they caught COVID. Many times, they have just assumed that those symptoms were normal for them. Like, oh, I've always been a tired person. I've always had IBS, etc. And then when they get hit by the infection, that is when they find that their symptoms, which were very mild, get so much worse. So it is highly likely that a majority of patients with long COVID have POTS. 
And the problem is that because the definition of the term POTS is so narrow, patients with long COVID will be managed as if they have a completely separate condition rather than being managed as a post-viral dysautonomia the way POTS is managed. And unfortunately, nowadays, there are too many doctors who are interested in treating conditions rather than treating patients. This means that many patients with long COVID may miss out on lots of helpful treatments which we use for POTS, um, and they will just be asked to hydrate and pace whilst we all wait for some fancy American pharmaceutical company to produce a mega expensive and potentially harmful new drug specifically for long COVID. I have hundreds of patients with long COVID, and I can categorically say that many of them feel much better when they're managed in the same way as I manage my POTS patients. In terms of optimal management for POTS patients, I use four approaches. Number one, lifestyle modification. Number two, physiotherapy. Number three, medications. And number four, patient advocacy, which is that the doctor, if he is interested in truly helping the patient, should try not only to get the patient feeling a bit better, but to tr should try and help the patient maintain their identity by advocating for them to access modifications, school, work, etc. So those are the four approaches I tend to use. You'll find uh, a lot more details about these approaches on my other videos on this channel. And I've even set up a website called www.potspecialist.com, so you can check those out. But to be honest, these measures do make a difference, but they don't seem to transform patients. I usually see, with all these four measures, I see like a 30, 40, 50% improvement, but my patients still remain enfeebled. So today I wanted to talk about an intervention that in my experience can be transformative for some patients. And in my opinion, it should be offered far more widely than it has been. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the benefit of regular intravenous saline infusions in POTS, and potentially even in many patients with long COVID. Right, now, one of the most consistent symptoms in POTS is that patients generally feel worse when they're upright. The one thing that happens when we're upright is that gravity comes into the equation and gravity will pull blood towards it and therefore it is more difficult for us to get the blood up to the brain, which is the furthest organ from the ground. And where the, we therefore have to rely heavily on our leg muscles and our blood vessels in our legs to squeeze and help push this blood upwards. In patients with POTS, this does not happen as well and therefore blood pools in the legs and therefore less blood is available for circulation. We also find that this same phenomenon happens when it is warm, because when it is warm, our blood vessels open up and therefore the leg vessels open up and this encourages more pooling, more room for this blood to sink into, which is being pulled down by gravity. Similarly, patients will also feel much worse after a big carbohydrate rich meal because the carbs need a lot more blood to go to the gut and the blood tends to pool in the gut. This is a phenomenon called splanchnic pooling. We also know that because of this reduction in circulating volume, the heart has to work with less blood. And therefore, over a period of time, the heart can actually become smaller, which means that the heart is now pushing less blood out with each heartbeat and has to beat faster to get the same amount of blood round. In addition, the leg muscles start getting deconditioned, which then propagates this vicious cycle that the patient finds himself in. We also know that patients with POTS tend to run low on the hormones that are produced by the kidneys to help retain water. So not only can't they circulate the blood, they can't even have, they even have difficulty holding on to it. This is why many patients with POTS will say that they are constantly urinating and many actually undergo investigation for a condition called diabetes insipidus because they're urinating so often that they are suspected to have this. If we can therefore increase the circulating volume, then patients feel better. Now, the easiest way to do so, at least theoretically, is to ask the patient to drink more. And this is why the first recommendation that we make is to ask the patient to substantially increase their fluid input to at least three liters of water daily and cut down on diuretics such as soda, etc., and reduce carbohydrate-rich meals. Because extra water does not stay in the blood vessels, we have to ask the patient to take more salt and electrolytes as these encourage fluid retention in the blood vessels. However, 
Despite these measures, patients only see a mild and at most a modest benefit. And the reasons for this are manifold. Number one, it requires a lot of discipline to make sure you're constantly hydrating. And if you're feeling awful all the time, that's quite difficult. Number two, the frequent urination is inconvenient, bothersome and tiring. You know, the patients struggle to even stand up. Just trying to go to the toilet 20 times a day is really hard. Many patients struggle with increasing salt intake and electrolytes because these can be very unpalatable. Patients with POTS suffer from gut issues, so they feel nauseous anyway and get easily bloated. And they may also have impaired digestion and this may have an impact on what they're absorbing. And finally, when the water finally gets into the blood vessels, they have difficulty holding on to it because of this deficiency in the hormones from the kidneys. So in some ways, if one could bypass the gut and in some way deliver the fluid with the right concentration of salt directly into the blood vessels, then you would expect to have quicker and more dramatic effects. And this is where the idea of giving intravenous saline comes in. The problem is that patients still struggle to hold on to the water for a prolonged period of time. So even though you can bypass the gut, get the water directly into the blood vessels, they get better with that, but because they cannot hold on to that fluid for long enough, they deteriorate after a few days. And this is why intravenous saline in this setting has to be given repeatedly every week, etc. Is there any evidence that intravenous saline infusions given repeatedly work? Well, there's a very interesting paper by a very prominent POTS physician called Blair Grubb, and he's from Toledo in the US. And he published this in the Journal of Interventional Cardiac Electrophysiology in 2017. And the paper was called Effects of Intravenous Saline Infusion in Patients with Medication Refractory POTS. And these guys, what they did was they took 57 patients who were already medicated and they were already on at least three different types of medications for their POTS, but they were still struggling. And they recorded measures of quality of life before initiating intravenous saline infusions regularly, one liter of intravenous saline every week. This was given by a peripheral cannula, and in a small number of patients, they were given through ports, bigger, you know, bigger things, uh, uh, catheters that are actually stuck in a bigger vessel. But the majority of them were given uh, the infusion through a little cannula in the arm here. And they were followed up. These patients were followed up over the next three to 12 months to see if they reported an improvement in quality of life. And the results are remarkable because it showed that only four patients out of these 57 did not feel that they had benefited. All the rest reported a benefit. And the benefit was seen in all domains across quality of life assessments. Most patients reported an immediate improvement in symptoms that lasted up to three days after the infusion. Many patients subsequently found that because they felt so much better, they were able to use that improvement to do more physiotherapy, get more condition, and many were then able to discontinue the IV fluids altogether. More importantly, there were no major adverse events from the intravenous saline. So this is clearly very encouraging, even though the study was non, a non-blinded observational study rather than the randomized placebo-controlled trial, which most doctors pay more attention to. Despite these encouraging data, as yet I'm unaware of anyone who is doing a randomized controlled trial. And this is probably because there's no real money to be made from intravenous saline, which is cheap as chips. Anyway, on the basis of this study, one would think that this is a simple, safe intervention. It's not expensive and it would be something worth offering those patients who continue to struggle despite lifestyle, physiotherapy, and medication. And I have many such patients who you do everything and they're still really struggling. And so I was keen to explore this option for my patients. Unfortunately, I found it far more difficult to convince the NHS gurus that this was worth trying for several reasons, and I'll list them out. Many, pa many doctors don't know anything about POTS. Many who do know about it don't believe in it. Those who do believe in it fail to understand why just telling the patient to drink more is not an adequate enough intervention. As POTS is not considered a dangerous condition, it does not seem to be important enough to address, even though to my mind, quality of life is really important. Many doctors feel that the benefit is simply due to a placebo effect even though you have to ask, 
whether that really even matters. Because if someone says, I don't enjoy my quality of life, and after being given a cheap, safe intervention, the same person says, I feel so much better, could you still call it placebo? Just because you can't explain it does not mean that it's not worth doing, because if it is about quality of life, then the patient's perception of their quality of life is what is important. And if you've made them feel better, then you've delivered an effective intervention. Finally, there are no easy mechanisms within a cash-strapped, space-starved, staff-depleted NHS to provide such a service. And despite all these challenges, I was really keen to see if I could access fluids for some of my patients. And my breakthrough came when one of my patients wrote to their MP, who turned out to be Mr. Rishi Sunak, who was then Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he was also her local MP. And Mr. Sunak wrote to me and said, look, you know, on the basis of humanitarian grounds, you should be offering this patient intravenous fluids because she's got children, uh, she can't look after them, she's incredibly debilitated, and she's missing out on life. And I agreed with that, but, but I was very grateful to have Mr. Sunak's support. So I took his letter to my hospital managers and they all agreed. And we started offering this lady intravenous saline. And because we were able to offer her saline, we could offer a few more patients intravenous saline. So we um, uh, started giving some of our worst affected patients, intravenous saline infusions were via peripheral cannulae. We don't put ports in because uh, ports carry a much higher risk of blood clots and infections. Uh, and therefore, when you're trying out a new intervention, you don't want to take anything, do something that could expose the patient to any kind of risk. So peripheral cannula are very safe. And I'm delighted to say that we, are now, we have now been giving intravenous fluids to about 30 or so of my worst affected patients, and the vast majority have found this simple intervention to be transformative. They come once a week, they sit in our day case unit, they receive intravenous saline, two liters of intravenous saline over a four hour period via peripheral cannula, they then go home and engage with physiotherapy because they feel better, they get more condition, and then they come back in a week and get the fluid again. We have not been able to offer it to more people simply because there's a shortage of resources, but I'm hoping that soon we'll be able to add our experience and develop an evidence base which will allow us to fund more resources. Now, I wanted to share some feedback from my patients in their own words with you, okay? So let's, this is from uh, a gentleman called Ben. He said, Dear Dr. Gupta, I thought I would write to you now as we are a couple of months into my IV treatment. I can't believe how much of a difference this treatment is making. I admit I was skeptical at first, but having run out of options in my treatment, I had no alternative but to give this a try. To start with, I didn't see much difference. But then after a couple of weeks, my wife commented that I looked different immediately after receiving treatment and that I looked well and my complexion was more refreshed. My skin was less pale. I had more of a glow about me. I am able to get more done than I have in the last six years on the day of the infusion. I can bear to stand up for longer where usually I would be rushing for a chair or my mobility scooter. This would last a day, but that day is time I can spend with my family instead of being left behind as I was unable to participate. I noticed a longer effect if I wear my compression stockings that I purchased from Amazon. Ever since that, um, I did this, ever since I did this, I'm able to extend these effects from my treatment into the following day. Although you only get one or two days of lesser symptoms from this treatment, it has made such a difference to me. I very much hope that funding will continue so that I am able to have more of a life instead of being confined to my home. This is uh, another feedback, another bit of feedback that I've received. Dear Dr. Gupta, H has now finished her once a week over four week course of intravenous infusions. I have to say, I did not expect the infusions to make such a difference to H, but they have. This therapy has given us glimpses of our daughter back that we haven't seen for over eight years. She has struggled not only with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but with chronic fatigue, brain fog, 
auditory delay, headaches, difficulty processing speech from others and giving a related answer. Therapy has given her so many benefits. She has not had a headache since starting treatment. For three days a week, she is animated, chatty and can process conversations correctly. Her energy levels have increased vastly for three days a week. She can do hobbies, sit downstairs. She is normally bed bound and has now been doing so for day, has now been on days out. This is huge for H and us as a family. If H were to continue and possibly have infusions twice a week, she may benefit so much. It would give her more family and friends time, less time being fatigued and a state of all consuming brain fog, which makes life so hard for her. She would not feel isolated. In H's words, she feels normal for those few days. To a disabled person, that word is huge. To a parent, it is a lifeline we thought she would never have. Thank you for this opportunity you have given to H. So as you can see, these are incredibly heartwarming stories and it is a shame that this is a service that is not offered more widely to carefully selected patients. Although one of the reasons is that there are no mechanisms, existing mechanisms in place to offer this service within existing NHS services, a bigger reason is the attitude of doctors. Doctors these days have the mentality, whenever they're faced with a complex problem or a complex patient, they will say, what will happen to me if I try and help this patient? What inconvenience will I put myself through for this patient? What will happen to me if I try and help this patient? And actually what they should be doing is they should be thinking, what will happen to this patient if I don't help them? My own feeling is that a doctor who is not prepared to put him or herself out of his or her comfort zone for the sake of the patient, then that doctor is not deserving of their title. I hope this video will empower patients who suffer from dysautonomia, POTS and long COVID to access the care that they truly deserve. As I say, we now have a website that I've started for patients with POTS. You can access lots of free resources. I've compiled these resources over five, six years of looking after patients with POTS. Uh, and I thought, well, should that not be available to everyone at no cost? And therefore I set up a website and the website is www.potspecialist.com. If you get a minute, please check it out and please let me know how you think we can make it better and more useful. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm so glad um, that I've been able to do a video this week. Uh, I love hearing from you. I read all your comments and all your comments contribute in making me feel happy and worthy. And I am so incredibly grateful. Thank you so much. All the best.